Hello and welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today we have a fascinating power panel. First is Peggy Polonis, the president of the American Community Schools of Athens. Good morning, Peggy. Hello, John. How are you? Great. We are so happy to have you here. Next up is Carlos Caprizo, the founder of Cosmos. Hello, Carlos. Hello, John. Thank you for being here. Next up, we have Ranim Gonim. A, she is a senior at American Community Schools at ACS Athens. Next up, we have Jason Somoglu. He is a senior at ACS Athens. And lastly, we have Evan Botsos. He is a middle school student at ACS Athens. Welcome. Hi. Well, thank you all for being here. We are very excited to hear all your insights that you have to share. And to get started, we would uh, like to start with Peggy. Um, as an educator and a psychologist, what do you consider to be your most important role in schools, and how do you believe resiliency can be taught? You know, John, it's always good to hear these young voices uh, on the topic, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing some of the students. But I just want to start by saying that years ago when I was training in psychology, and I had the opportunity to train with some very noteworthy people in the field. Among them was a well-known psychotherapist. Her name was Virginia Satir. And she was a woman who, at the time, penetrated the then male-dominated field of psychology and created her own well-accepted theories about human behavior. And she told me at the time something that I never forgot. She said that, always remember that people like us who are psychologists or educators are in the business of people-making. So I think this is my most important role. And... Schools, like families, are microcosms of the world. Many of the experiences and learnings that we have in both of these places will follow us to a large degree for the rest of our lives. And resilient individuals can adjust, they can adapt, they can successfully navigate through life's difficulties and challenges. They grow and they move forward no matter what happens. And like, for example, now during the pandemic, we all had a common goal to move online, to do so successfully, to learn, to teach, to continue the teaching and the learning. And at some point, we went online, we came back to school, we had to go back online, now we're back in school. All of this took preparation, but most importantly, it took a particular kind of mindset and culture that we may not all have the answers at all times, but you know what? We're going to figure them out as we go along. So can resilience be taught, as you said? It can be developed. It can be developed through the experiences that we have and the attitudes that we adopt towards these experiences. And so schools, like families, play a vital role in the opportunities provided for students um, so that they can grow and develop resili and be resilient in different ways. And since we are creative human beings, we always want to know more, and we naturally move towards solutions. Even some of our problems or symptoms are faulty attempts to finding solutions or getting rid of some kind of pain. In the business of people making, that's very insightful. And ACS App is, is certainly leading that way along with your leadership. So we thank you for that. Um, moving over to Carlos, uh, to give a little bit of background, you spent 25 years in the tech space as an executive for two Fortune 500 companies and the president and board member of a privately held mid-market company. So can you tell us a little bit about the intersection between humanity and technology in this age of accelerations, as you call it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I couldn't agree more with uh, Peggy when she talks about resiliency at the individual level, but it also applies at the society level, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to first start reading a quote from my recently released book, At Risk of Greatness. It's from Peter Drucker. So for the younger audience out there who might not know who Peter Drucker is, uh, he was a man, a man born in the early uh, 20th century. He's considered one of the founders of modern management. And his interest in management was really to improve society, ultimately. Uh, so he, he stated, in a few hundred years, when the history of our time is written from a long-term perspective, I think it's very probable that the most important event those historians will remember is not technology, not the internet, not e-commerce, but the unprecedented change in the human condition. 
Why? Because humanity has used technology for millennia and it has improved our human condition without a doubt. However, today's advanced technologies and the acceleration that we're uh, seeing makes us face a phase of unintended consequences that is negatively impacting our human condition. For example, the increase in feelings of isolation, more so with the pandemic, increase in teenage suicide rates, or business models based on our personal data or, or our attention, right? So I call that the slingshot effect. We are feeling now the pinch back before we actually thrust forward. So with, with advances in automation and artificial intelligence in particular, machines have become their own species. I believe that machine will help us evolve and become a better version of ourselves. So man and machine reciprocally affecting each other's evolution or a, a term that I borrowed from biology, co-evolution, right? Now for this improvement in our human condition to take place, we cannot be complacent and we must always ask questions focused on safety, sustainability and responsibility. And to me, that is where philosophy and the arts become critical on asking those questions. Machines becoming their own species, that's certainly a different perspective, but one that I, I honestly agree with. So that was very insightful. Thank you for that. Moving on to Raneem, um, you are a senior at ACS Athens, so when you're, you're in your final year. So during your time in school, have you been involved in significant community service projects? Two that stand out are the Youth to Youth Project and Kenosos, um, can you tell us briefly how these have added to your learning and growth and why they are so important? Um, of course. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, these two projects, they mainly taught me the value of empathy when it comes to leadership positions. Now, um, you know, no, so the first project that you mentioned, uh, I was actually chosen to be one of the four committee leaders, mainly the leader of the economic and finance committee, in which I was basically in charge of all the cash flows entering and leaving the club. Now, despite me being, um, let's say, exposed to firsthand administrative and budgeting work from such a young age, I would like to say that the main insight and the main lesson that I learned out of this experiment, experiment, the experience, is the fact that I was able to uh, identify and connect a lot of our objectives and decisions to sustainable development goals. For instance, the goal of no poverty is one which was really highlighted in all of our um, actions that we took, since we would come together as a club and we would think of many different creative ways in order to raise enough money or obtain different donations to provide them to the homeless with the hope in our minds that we want to diminish, somewhat diminish the land of poverty that's present in Athens. Now, um, for this reason, I would like to say that yes, I grew as a leader, I uh, obtained leadership skills in this club, but I also, my I widened my perspective in terms of sustainable development goals that are present in my day-to-day -day life. Now, the Youth to Youth project, the second project that you mentioned, um, this project is one that is really close to my heart because I come from a place where I understand what it feels like to not have somewhere to call home. Uh, for this reason, uh, the way that I would describe the Youth to Youth program is that it is a two-way evolve, meaning that not only do these unaccompanied minors benefit from us as volunteers by helping them develop their social skills, their academic skills, and even their athletic skills, but we as volunteers, we benefit from um, leadership and communication skills, but also we gain uh, the values of empathy and gratitude. And I believe that these two uh, values are two that are extremely important to be implemented in everyone's life. So overall, I would say that these two they really helped me widen my perspective in terms of uh, understanding the importance of having values when undertaking any sort of decision. Certainly sounds like those two projects did gave, gain you a lot of experience and, and widening your perspective. Um, moving on to, to Jason, uh, you, you're a senior at ACS Athens and for a little context you have been recognized on national TV for your contributions to robotics and community service and you were also featured in Forbes magazine so it seems like you have quite the credentials there. Uh, you've been actively involved with robotics and AI, and you have won many awards internationally. Um, you've been featured in Forbes Greece, and there was a recent documentary created highlighting your success in these areas. What makes your work so significant at your age? Uh, yeah, so doing the things that I do at my age is probably the most important part of my life. Uh, I wanted to show the world the innovative spirit that people my age have and how we should be taking advantage of it. My goal overall was to prove to others that 
age doesn't necessarily provide someone with the maturity needed to help in real life problems and with the solutions. So I started um, robotics around five years ago and the first project I did was had to do with recycling. So we would find a way to automate recycling uh, at source uh, so we could help with sustainability and at the same time make profit for the tenants who recycled. And then I moved on to creating a smart city that had sustainable goals. It would uh, share energy between households uh, so that you could minimize uh, the amount of energy consumed. Overall, all of these projects that I've been doing all these years have to do with real life problems and address real life solutions. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I also participated in a group that 3D printed masks that was distributed uh, around the country to assist um, uh, with the pandemic. Now I have moved on from uh, becoming a student and I've, I'm coaching teams hopefully trying to pass on the, the flame of what I've done to other students and trying to inspire them to also make a difference. That's fascinating. It sounds like you've really taken your skills and utilized them in real world issues and problems that were currently affected today. Um, moving on to Evan, um, you are a middle school student, ACS Athens, and at nine years old, you created the Green Team, which focused on creating innovative scientific projects. Um, as the youngest of the group here today, um, you were in middle school when you became interested in AI and robotics. Can you please tell us how this happened and how you were encouraged to turn this theory into practice? Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for having me here. This gives me the opportunity to present what has happened to my school that will help make the world a better place. My name is, of course, as you heard, Evangelos Botsios, or Evan Botsios. And my friend right here is Sophia. She's a humanoid that uses artificial intelligence and robotics. Well, she is still in progress. Now, in order to answer my question, let me go back in time. My interest started from elementary school. When I was in first grade, my teacher let me present an interesting project about the water cycle. At the end of the presentation, I got an idea to make clean water with simple materials. I was inspired to start thinking about using sustainable energy in order to have clean water and help people who are in need of it. I noticed that something was missing. I needed to spread this idea to more people, beginning from my classmates. That's how the Green Team was created. Two years later, in a school project, as a team, we were inspired and created the Green City, a city where all energy comes from sustainable sources. The city was missing something, technology. How can smart cities help build a sustainable world. Smart means using artificial intelligence and Internet of Things technology. I started to study robotics and artificial intelligence. In continuation, I got into the mentor program and built a smart city using the Internet of Things and central controlling management. With this project, the Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence Lab began. You asked me something very important. How did I turn theory into practice? It is very challenging, and I assure you that the distance between them is vast. But when you have hands-on, you have two benefits. One, you prove that the theory works, and second, students can see your work and get inspired. As a result, students become more friendly towards technology, and especially with artificial intelligence. Wow, um, you know, Evan, for someone for your age, you're, you're addressing some very big issues, some very important issues. And so we thank you for turning those into disciplines. Um, and that, that leads me perfectly into my next question for Dr. Peggy Colonis. Um, with STEM and artificial intelligence being growing disciplines, um, are, are machines gradually taking over? And, and how and when should schools teach these types of topics? Yeah, John, I, I certainly believe that teaching science Technology and mathematics is important. We can't understand the world without them. They answer questions about things like nature and the universe, health, transportation, economics. They help us apply this knowledge. They help us make predictions, solve complex problems, and they also make our lives easier. So certainly these need to be taught, which is why we're also expanding our artificial intelligence curriculum all the way down to kindergarten uh, in our school. And you might say, you know, what do young people need to know about artificial intelligence? Why? Well, it's about understanding big ideas such as perception. 
how do computers see the world using sensors? And how does this translate in daily life? So it's about understanding what computers do, and later on we go to how they do them. But I believe that understanding these concepts is not enough, just as Evan said. It's also important to combine understanding with hands-on experience. So now, are machines going to take over? Well, it's true that machines are and will be able to perform human life tasks. And it's hard to predict the future. But it's really up to us to make sure that we take care in how we design them. And while STEM is important, so are the arts and philosophy, just like Carlos said, and so is the lens of ethical decision-making and conscious citizenship to design them in a way that will prevent harm and possible takeover. Instead, to design them in ways that make life better and act, they act to support human beings. And this is what makes us human after all. The ability to think about the kind of future that we want and to make intentional choices in the direction that we would like to go. I think that's fascinating. Teaching artificial intelligence and these big concepts at such a young age, I think, is, is a great idea. I wasn't introduced to these type of topics until I was a teenager, you know, in, into high school. So I think teaching them young, having them explore those ideas can only allow them to further grow and further develop. Um, into a world um, that we've been talking about today, which is one full of technology and full of these large concepts. Um, moving over to Carlos, um, as founder of Cosmos, your mission is to create an economic growth and social inclusion for young adults. How do you see this happening? Thanks, John. You know, definitely through the intersection of art and technology, uh, STEM field, science, technology, engineering, math are necessary. However, they're not sufficient to differentiate ourselves from machines, particularly in the future or going forward. So we've all heard, you know, the great skills that uh, Ranim and Jason and Evan have on the STEM side. Uh, I'm going to out them out. They also have artistic skills. You know, I've learned through interacting with them that they either draw or play the piano, right? And they've done that for a number of years. So art is what really keeps us human and will enable young adults from competing with machines. Hence the steam, steam concept that uh, Peggy mentioned, right? So how do we do it with Cosmos? We are in the validation stage still of braiding arts activities with technology training to develop curiosity, collaboration and communication, plus creative and critical thinking. All essential for us not to think like machines. So the biggest risk is not that machines are gonna think like us. I mean, that's gonna happen, right? The biggest risk is that we end up thinking like machines. So more important than Cosmos, However, it's a STEAM movement, a movement that has been years in the making and it's accelerating globally. So it's a movement that's unleashing awesome possibilities to acquire 21st century skills and abilities through the intersection of art and technology. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, moving over to Ramin, um, you intend to study economics in college and since you are at the final year of ACS Athens, that's coming up shortly here, in light of recent economic issues as a result of the lockdown, how do you see yourself contributing to better economic practice, and how can one combine profit and ethical citizenship? Okay, I would just like to start off by saying that um, the impact of better economic practice is something that can only be seen in the long run, meaning that it's not something that can happen overnight. And as a high school student, as a senior actually, um, I feel like it may not be entirely possible to contribute to, let's say, better major uh, global economic practice in terms of lowering interest rates or increasing worker wages. But what I believe um, I, along with other students, can do to contribute to better economic practice is uh, by increasing our engagement in education. Now, again, as I said before, since uh, better economic practice is something that can be seen in the long run, uh, the way I see it is that we as students today, we will be part of the labor force of the future, meaning that it is our duty for the future to ensure a strong economic um, sector and, and overall economic growth, as Mr. Carlo mentioned before. And considering that the education sector is one of the main pillars of the economy, it is our duty now as students to ensure that we develop all the qualities that all the skills and all the knowledge that we must obtain in order for us to implement in the future and hopefully 
collapse the global economy out of the recession that has resulted from this pandemic. Now, uh, you mentioned profit with ethical citizenship. Well, it is without say, obviously, that society is shifting towards a more sustainable future, and that is really seen through many businesses who were actually changing their objectives to be in line with the Paris Agreement. Now, I believe that profit and ethical citizenship are directly proportional, meaning that as uh, social responsibility and ethical citizenship increase, profit is going to increase, but only in the long run, because uh, again, society is still developing to a sustainable future. Therefore, now in the short run, as uh, we start as a society to change towards a more sustainable one, there will be costs incurred in, in terms of environmental costs, setup costs, operation costs, there will be costs. Uh, and actually, in my physics class, we learned of different energy sources, like production energy sources, uh, and their impact on the greenhouse effect. And I would just like to say that the lesson, the lesson that I learned in that class and the knowledge that I have about the economy and the global economy, I believe that it is possible, essentially, to profit as a result of ethical citizenship. Uh, obviously, again, in the long run, by the time that society has changed to a more sustainable one. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you, Raneem. And switching from ethical citizenship to conscious, conscious citizenship, Jason, you're already combining conscious citizenship with AI and robotics, as seen by your contributions during the COVID-19 lockdown. Can you tell us what you did and why is conscious ethical citizenship important? Yes. Um, so <clears throat> during the COVID-19 lockdown uh, in Greece, a lockdown that ranged for five months, uh, I joined an initiative that, that provided hospitals with face masks. Uh, this was possible through the creation of 3D printed masks, uh, which was an idea that had originated um, from a company called Prusa. Uh, this initiative was uh, dedicated to gathering volunteers from uh, all around Greece that possessed a 3D printer. And using those 3D printers, we could print masks and deliver them around the nation to hospitals and uh, doctors in need. Now, I believe this is an example of what ethical citizenship is because all these volunteers from around Greece and from around the world combine their collective skills to help in a time of uncertainty and help their respective communities overcome uh, great challenges. This is why uh, ethical citizenship is important because by becoming these conscious ethical citizens, we can ultimately overcome any difficulty that comes our way. Well, thank you for your contributions and, and helping those in need during a, a global pandemic. It's, it's very admirable. Um, moving over to Evan, our, our young entrepreneur here. Um, so you've already created the green team, and as I understand it, you're now developing a green smart campus. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit, and what do you need to make that a reality? Again, before I answer the question, I want to mention something. ACS has always been on my side, not only because it encouraged and inspired me, but because it gave me the tools I needed to pursue my vision. Now let's go to the question. The Green Team's members meet and discuss problems that the environment has and take initiative for projects that will be exhibited during the year. Our latest concern is to expand Green Team throughout the campus and give students from higher grades the chance to get involved. I want to mention two very successful presentations. The first one was in the Athens Science Fair, which happened in April 2019 or the Green and Smart City was presented. The second presentation was in February 2020 in the Innovation Summit of ACS. The Green and Smart City is a city that presents five forms of sustainable energy. It is electric, solar, wind, biofuel, and hydrogen energy. Not only does it present sustainable forms of energy, it also presents automation by using artificial intelligence, robotics, and internet of things. There are three features that make a green city smart. The first feature is the highways that use a lot of electricity regardless of the traffic. In a smart city, there are smart cameras which will turn on and off a light when a car passes by. The second feature is the grid for electricity. When a house isn't using electricity, the energy from the solar panel is wasted. However, the smart city takes this electricity and transfers it to the house that is in need of it. The third feature monitors and regulates atmospheric pollution. This means that when the carbon dioxide levels are high in a congested area, the sensors will use Internet of Things and create a detour so as to prevent additional pollution in that area. Now, the Green and Smart City can be implemented by introducing this idea 
to a small municipality that will be willing to accept a pilot project to exhibit the beneficial features of a smart city. We are already transforming ACS and want to continue this journey, not just in schools, but in the whole world. This joint venture can only become a reality if everyone has a common vision of making the world a better place for the minimum pollution possible. That's amazing. I, I hope to one day see a city similar to the one you just described. I think that it would great it would, it would it would very much push forward the sustainable development goals and just overall make society and the individuals living in it happier and healthier and more sustainable. Um, moving to Dr. Peggy Polonis, what does the future of education look like or what should it look like? Well, I think, first of all, John, if we leave it to the students and guide them a little bit, they probably have a lot more solutions than we do. But if anything, this lockdown experience taught us that it's possible to teach remotely, online, uh, or even in a blended way. I don't think that we can really go back to teaching only face-to-face. -face. The teacher is no longer the only person in a classroom that has certain knowledge or information. Information is abundant and it's easily accessible. So teachers will be more facilitators of learning and students will be able to carve their own learning path or at least they'll co-carve their learning path with some guidance. This is why our vision here in the school is empowering individuals to be architects of their own learning. We want students to be independent learners who know where to find information but who also, we also want to guide them to think about the information critically, to ask questions, to be curious, and to synthesize it, synthesize it in such a way so that they can go to the next level of creativity and innovation. So student learning will be more flexible, more personalized in the future, certainly more technology focused, that's inevitable. But what we must not lose sight of is what makes us human. Uh, as we all said before. Most importantly, however, let's not forget that one of the greatest desires of humans is to be happy. We do all the things that we do because of a deep desire to be happy. Can machines help us be healthier, happier, more creative, more capable? These are the questions to keep in mind when designing machines. And this can be taught. Well, Dr. Polonis, that, that style of education you just described resonates a lot with me. I just recently graduated from American University here in Washington, D.C., and the style of education was cohort style. So it was much like you described, that professors facilitated it, and it was up to us as the students to kind of help guide our learning. And I think that bringing that down into, into younger levels of education would just, would just help facilitate the education and overall um, have a more well-rounded education. So I, I completely agree with that. Um, moving on to Carlos, you know, not only having 25 years of tech experience, but you also have a book titled At Risk of Greatness. And in this book, it challenges people to think outside the box. What does this mean to you? And, uh, you know, uh, Peggy, John, I'm glad this is a panel and not a debate, because uh, it would be hard to debate when we all agree with the, uh, with the, you know, cohort style or teachers as facilitators of learning. So. To me, thinking outside the box has become a mainstream concept for decades, right? And it has lost a little bit of meaning. Uh, to me, the critical piece is what Peggy mentioned, curiosity, right? Asking questions. So in, in my book, I quote uh, Ian Leslie, an author of uh, Curious, the desire to know and why your future depends on it. So he, what he said in, in a lecture is that we're programmed to be curious. We're born with that very powerful instinct that there is stuff that we don't know. And we're also born with that instinct that other people are those sources of knowledge. So little children are investigative reporters pumping their sources for knowledge, right? And there's a researcher, uh, Michel Lyonard, and he recorded conversations that families have at home and discovered that between the ages of three and five, children ask 40,000 questions on average. And the questions that they asked were specifically explanatory. How and why? So the evolutionary reason for this is that we are cultural animals. And the way we survive is by becoming part of a larger cultural vehicle. So we realize that we need to learn if we're going to survive. We need to learn a lot, so we ask a lot of questions. Now, 
curiosity and questions go hand in hand. And it's important, however, that the questions that we ask are the right ones. So Leslie, for example, he divides curiosity in two. One is diverse, so that's the hunger for the new, the novel. And unfortunately, that's what makes us click on the next flashing link on Netflix or YouTube, right? But that can lead us into a uh, rabbit hole. So it is nice because it takes us in different directions. It can also have a drawback. So by itself, that diverse curiosity can be superficial and futile. So there's the epistemic curiosity, which is what happens when this diverse curiosity grows up. So when we combine that diverse curiosity with effort, self-discipline, and focus, that's when it becomes deeper and more enduring. So it's our lifelong quest for knowledge, for learning, or as some people call it, hyper-learning in this uh, age of acceleration. So it's desire not just to find answers, but to explore new questions, absolutely. Programmed to be curious, that's a fascinating perspective. And it certainly sounds like from what we've heard today that ACS Athens is not only helping, but facilitating that in a positive way across its students. Moving on to Rene, um, as, as a young woman who is also involved in sciences, what are your hopes for the future in this area of young women across the globe? Um, actually, I want to start off by saying a short story. Um, about a year or so ago, I undertook this research project in my Arabic class in which we basically had to research about women in the labor force. And one statistic that really surprised me was that women in the science sector only make up about 3% or less of the entire workers there. And I remember it surprising me a lot because I started questioning the reasoning behind it. But then I came to the conclusion that the lack of role model of young women and women in general being roles in that industry is something that contributes to the statistics in the slow. And I came to this conclusion by looking at Daniel Pink's theory of motivation, which he states that in order for an employee to be happy and motivated in uh, um, the work area, they must um, ensure autonomy, mastery, purpose. Now, I focused on purpose and I realized that considering the lack of uh, women role models in that industry, women now, they don't have something to something larger to connect themselves to. They, they don't have anything, uh, they don't find the purpose for them to be in that sector, making it inevitable for men to make up uh, more of the percentage of that sector. Yet at the same time, despite this low statistic, I strongly believe in the idea that anyone, being that, be them male or female, they, anyone is strongly capable of achieving whatever they want if they put their heart and mind to it. Um, uh, personally, I find myself drawn to the uh, subject of physics, as I mentioned before. But even though it's not my passion and it's not something that I see myself in the future, I find it fascinating how such a simple science class can basically describe and explain all the natural phenomena that occur. And for this reason, I believe that the scientific knowledge that people can obtain uh, is something that shouldn't be taken for granted. And therefore, I strongly hope for young women around the world to understand that the idea of gender barriers are just something created by society. They're created by society, they're passed down through generations, and they're engraved in our minds, making us believe that they're actually there. They're there, but they're not necessarily true, and they're not necessarily correct, and we shouldn't necessarily follow them. And I want to connect to a movie that I watched called Hidden Figures, which is based off of a true story about three black women who they broke the traditional gender barriers by proving themselves worthy, but by, um, by working amongst men at NASA. And this movie is actually uh, this movie is what made me believe in the notion that gender barriers are just created by society, and they're there chaining us to believe something that isn't necessarily true. And for this reason, I really hope for young women to break free from these chains, whoever has passion in the field of the sciences, I really hope for them to break free from these chains in order for them to become part of the science sector and for them to become the role models of future generation of young women, for them to hopefully find a purpose in uh, working in that sector. That was very profound. Um, you, I mean, I couldn't agree more. You're absolutely right. Unfortunately, even though those gender barriers are there, they might not be right and they might not be correct to follow. And it certainly exactly. sounds like you are paving the way to break those barriers. Um, <laughs> moving on to, to, to Jason, um, a simple but profound question that I think you'll have some great insights into is, what is the best way to develop ethical, critical thinking from your perspective? Yeah, so uh, in my opinion, Critical thinking involves thoughtful and systematic processing of information so that we can better understand the 
the complexity of issues and make uh, sounder decisions. So a critical mind, I believe, is a questioning mind. Hence, critical thinking develops through an inquiry-based learning process. So asking the essential questions and posing problems or scenarios inspire a quest for knowledge and problem solving. So and seeking answers to questions is fundamental to understanding ourselves, understanding others in the larger world, and being a change agent. However, in tackling collaborative problem solving in the global context, people also need to be aware of the complexity of issues uh, from these multiple perspectives. They need to acquire dialogue skills, they need to understand another, another's point of view, they need to be aware of one's own assumptions, be self-aware, other aware, and engage in the metacognitive skills. So the six ways I feel like uh, we could use to improve critical thinking are the following. One is we could become more self-aware. Two is we could understand uh, our own mental processes and everybody else's mental processes. Three is we could develop uh, foresight. Four is we could practice uh, active listening. Five is, of course, asking questions. And finally, is evaluating existing evidence. Uh, evaluating this, you know, feel like those six are the key points uh, to this topic. Thank you, Jason. Um, we, we've heard quite a lot today here on this panel. And for our last question, I would like to pose it to our young innovator, Evan. Um, how do you think we can make the planet a better place to live for all? Uh, that's a huge question. There are many different approaches to make the planet a better place. By curing disease, reducing poverty, ending wars, ending hunger, and sadly, the list goes on. Despite all the obstacles the planet faces, I will focus on reducing world pollution by implementing futuristic technologies and vision that will help make a more sustainable world and may have more sustainable choices. Just like Mr. Doc, Dr. Pelonis mentioned earlier, it is vital to start from education so the younger generation is exposed to the concerns about a planet and is properly educated on how to solve them. As Mr. Carlos also mentioned, with technology, our world is changing very quickly and we must adapt to it. We must not see technology as our enemy, but our ally to help save our planet. Internet of Things and artificial intelligence are now part of our daily lives and we haven't even realized. Internet of Things is everywhere around you, starting from simple internet browsers to complex online storages like the cloud. Additionally, artificial intelligence also surrounds you. From the suggestions that your explorer provides you to analyzing the spectrum of unlimited data which is collected. Big data collection can help us better understand, analyze, and make decisions that could help us have a better everyday life. Well, thank you, Evan. Today we've heard some very inspirational and motivational things across the board from our panel uh, from multiple ages. And I would like to thank, uh, in particular, Dr. Peggy Polonis for helping organize this. ACS Athens is certainly leading the way when it comes to education, educational standards, and how it's being rewritten. So thank you, Dr. Peggy Polonis, for your leadership during these times. And thank you to all of our panelists for just incredible, insightful moments today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having us. Thank you.